we here in Asia are extremely delighted and thankful for Henry's uh, lectures. Uh, uh, Henry Maxfield, maybe let me just introduce Henry in case there are students who have made the mistake of not, of not having uh, uh, read his papers before. Uh, uh, Henry is a postdoc now at UCSD and before was a postdoc at McGill. Uh, Henry in the past has done amazing work on a variety of subjects, but right now he is uh, leading uh, probably the most exciting current in uh, our little community, which is learning about the aspect of uh, the black hole information paradox from a new perspective that he will tell us about. And I guess I won't belabor this anymore. Henry, you have the microphone and thank you again very much for giving these lectures. Well, thank you for the uh, very generous introduction, Bartek. Um, let me hopefully my hopefully you can all see my shared screen um good yeah so i'm going to give um uh some lectures on what might seem to be two uh slightly separate topics but we've learned that they're intimately related in the last couple of years and that's going to be one of the the main things i want to try to explain so um we're going to start off by uh there'll be two sort of main parts to the lectures so the first couple of lectures will be focusing on uh, black hole information. First of all, uh, reviewing what the problem is. So mostly today we'll be talking about uh, black holes in quantum mechanics and, uh, and uh, a particular formulation of this uh, information problem. Uh, and then in the second lecture, we'll talk more about the uh, new developments uh, that have happened in the last couple of years. And then uh, part two, Will naturally link us onto these things called space-time wormholes, and uh, as an example, these were studied a lot in the 80s, but have had a something of a resurgence due to, uh, at least partly, due to this uh, information problem. So, um, so yeah. So, um, where do we want to start? Um, and um, throughout the the the, uh, the lectures, we're going to uh, use. A nice uh, example, a uh, uh, gravitational system. So the other thing we'll um, be talking about is uh, how to solve this system and, and calculate things in it in in a variety of different contexts, both perturbative and, and non-perturbative effects. So that's going to be so-called uh, Jakeev Teitelboim gravity, which is a two-dimensional model. And uh, sometimes we're going to um, couple this to matter, specifically conformally invariant matter. So. Uh, this will be a nice example uh, that can illustrate things we're going to talk about uh, very explicitly. Um, but most of the things I say, I think, uh, apply much more generally. Okay, so let's uh, make a start. Before we go straight into black holes, uh, I'd like to talk about um, entropy and quantum systems uh, to make sure we're all on the, on the same page. Uh, no pun intended, but... Uh, so we're going to start off thinking about just ordinary quantum systems and review some things that that uh, that we may uh, be familiar with and uh, some of Tanashi's lectures will, will set me up nicely to uh, to start this okay so there are various things we could mean by various notions of entropy that we could talk about uh, so the first one to introduce uh, is the von neumann entropy so suppose we have some system with a density matrix rho, describing the state of the system, uh, then the von Neumann entropy, I'll always exclusively use this S to mean the von Neumann entropy. Uh, we'll use sort of add various subscripts and things to denote other things. So minus the trace of uh, rho log rho. And uh, in Tadashi's talk, he's already explained that this is at least sometimes called entanglement entropy. Uh, particularly in the case where uh, rho is, uh, say, a uh, the reduced density matrix of some, so you have rho twiddle, which lives in some Hilbert space, uh, A tensor B, and you maybe trace over B. So this, this rho twiddle is a density matrix on some tensor product Hilbert space, and this rho is a density matrix on A taken by uh, tracing over all the degrees of freedom in B. 
So this is one, one example, it's called entanglement entropy because it quantifies the entanglement between A and B if this rho twiddle is a pure state. Uh, but I'll use this more general term von Neumann entropy because it's useful in some, uh, when it's, it doesn't necessarily always quantify entanglement. But of course, this is not the first type of uh, entropy we, uh, we meet. Uh, we're more familiar with thermodynamic entropy and this uh, row can't be a thermodynamic entropy because in particular, if we do time evolution, so rho goes to u, rho u dagger, so maybe u is some time evolution operator, uh, then the um, then this uh, von Neumann entropy just evolves to itself. So it's this is unitarily invariant. So it can't possibly be the sort of entropy that appears in the second law. So there's no second law for for this this sort of entropy. So we also want need to talk about uh, um, what well, I'll I'll be rather general and um, talk about thermal entropies as well. And uh, these are defined by defining some coarse graining. Oops. This is going to be important. Okay, um, I think I'm going to run out of. Uh, yeah, and um, we'll carry on here before we get to the next page. Um, so, coarse graining, what does that mean? It means that, um, that we uh, regard some states as being indistinguishable. So it means we throw away some knowledge about the state rho, and by throwing away some knowledge about the state rho, we can have an entropy that quantifies our sort of ignorance. Let's be more precise about that. So what we're first of all going to define is a set of macroscopic observables. And there's many choices we could make uh, for what this, this might be. Uh, we'll get some examples in a moment. Uh, but these we can think of as the things that we can easily measure uh, and have access to. Uh, so this is some set of operators O. And we can define a thermal entropy of the density matrix rho by first of all, considering, uh, considering all the possible density matrices um, rho twiddle such that the expectation value of these coarse grained operator uh, of these macroscopic observables uh, is the same as our actual state rho. And then uh, we take this, uh, this set of observables and we look at the von Neumann entropy of each of these density matrices and uh, it's a very important thing that I haven't left space for, which is the maximum here. So we take all possible density matrices that give us the correct expectation values for these observables O. We compute the von Neumann entropy for all these density matrices, and then we maximize over, over rho twiddle. Um, okay. And uh, we can also define the uh, rho thermal is uh, the density matrix rho twiddle that attains this maximum. So this is um, something that we're very familiar with for certain sets of observables. Um, well, first of all, let's just give a little bit of intuition for what this is. It's if we have some kind of thermodynamic limit, uh, then um, if we have many um, orthogonal states, uh, let's say um, pure states psi with um, with the correct values of the observables, at least approximately. Um, then, um, then this density matrix S rho twiddle is going to be roughly the logarithm of N. So N is the number of states of many. Okay. Um, so of course the example we're very familiar with is you just choose this set of coarse grained observables to just be uh, the Hamiltonian. And you could include, oops, yeah. Um, so if, if our only coarse grained observable is the Hamiltonian, then this is something we're very familiar with, for even, even from classical statistical mechanics. Uh, so in other words, we're fixing trace of 
rho times the Hamiltonian to be some energy, which is the, the actual energy of our system. And, um, and the, the thermal entropy at this point is the, is the usual canonical entropy. So rho thermal here is going to be rho canonical of beta for some value of beta. This is e to the minus theta h over big beta. This is be very familiar. So this is the normalizing trace e to the minus theta h um, for some value of beta. Okay. Um, and then the canonical entropy, uh, the useful way to express it, which we'll use later, is going to be minus the derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature, where the free energy, just to remind you, is minus t times log over the Laplace function. Okay. Um, so this is, of course, extremely familiar. This is one uh, notion of a coarse-grained entropy, and this is very useful in, um, in, in equilibrium situations. So if we're in equilibrium, and the maybe the only conserved quantity is the is the energy, then this is very useful. And of course, we learn a great deal from it. Uh, but we might be want to do something a little bit more, um, uh, give ourselves a little bit more information. So one example here is uh, in something like hydrodynamics. Um, this the coarse grained observables are uh, is are giving us maybe the um, the uh, stress energy tensor, for example, is a function of space. So there you can have some local energy density that varies with space, and you can look for the state that uh, maximizes, again, there's this maximization procedure, maximizes the von Neumann entropy, subject to having some particular profile where there's maybe uh, more energy in one place than there is another. So there's a temperature that varies with space. Okay, so this hopefully is, uh, is all going too slowly to begin with. Um, it's all, all rather familiar, um, but we're going to apply this um, to talk about what's called the page curve. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do is prepare some system. This is some quantum system A, uh, and we're going to um, put it in thermal contact with some other system B. And we'll, we'll most of the time we'll just think about B as being the uh, the sort of surroundings of A. And there's going to be some interactions between A and B. So we're going to have, uh, initially, we're going to put A in its ground state, uh, sorry, in some excited pure state. And B is going to be in its ground state. But then we're going to have some energy leaking from A into B. So there's going to be some, uh, some some energy going going from one to the other. So something to have in mind here maybe is just you have a lab with a box of uh, of photons or something, and there's a little hole in your box, and it allows the uh, the the energy to leak out into B. Uh, so eventually, A is going to be an evaporating black hole, and B is going to be the rest of the universe that contains the, the Hawking radiation. But it's useful now to have in mind something that's that's more familiar. Um, good. So. We know that, uh, uh, that finally, if this system B is much bigger than the system A, eventually all the energy is going to move from A into B. A is going to cool down to its ground state and B, um, so A is going to be in the ground state. And um, uh, so that means that B is in, is in some, some excited state again. Um, but importantly, because we started with a pure state and we've evolved unitarily and we've ended up with, uh, with A in a unique state, this here has to be P. Um, but um, we, can learn, we, can, um, we can learn more by, by thinking about what goes on in the middle here, be a bit more quantitative about this. So this tells us that we, we start with A in a pure state and B in a pure state, and we end with A in a pure state and B in a pure state but that's not going to be true in the middle. Uh, instead, we can think about these, um, these thermal entropies that I gave before. And the important thing they do here is they bound um, the von Neumann entropy, S of rho A, which equals S of rho B. So this is the entanglement entry in this case. Um, so it means that this, this entanglement entropy, either of these two uh, is, bounded by the minimum of the thermal entropy of A and the thermal entropy of B. 
Okay. Um, and the reason is simply that, uh, that we've done this, this coarse graining. So we defined our thermal entropies by some maximization procedure. Um, and, the, uh, and if you maximize subject to some smaller set of constraints, then you get a, a larger number than you would without those constraints. So that's, that's why we have, uh, we have this bound. So always um, S is bounded by both of these things. So uh, early times, um, maybe I'll find this as well. So let's color. So um, at early times, we've got lots of energy in system A, and system B is in its uh, in its vacuum state. So um, we'll start off with uh, the entropy of thermal entropy of A will be very large, and it'll decrease over time as it cools in some way. Um, so this is uh, S thermal of A. And uh, S thermal of B is the other way. So it's the thermal entropy of B. It starts off in its ground state, which is going to have uh, zero energy if you've got no energy, uh, zero entropy rather, if, there's, if it's, in its, um, if it's uh, got no energy. And eventually it's, got, uh, it's going to be in some excited state. So, it, uh, so some simple definition of the thermal entropy will be large. Um, so, the, um, so that means that the actual von Neumann entropy has to be below both of these curves. And typically, we actually expect it to saturate. So we expect it to increase for a while following um, S thermal A, and then decrease, excuse me, following S thermal B, and then decrease for uh, after this time. So this is the function of time. So this is the this von Neumann entropy. OK. Uh, and this is in the context of black holes. This is called the page curve because it was introduced by Don Page as a, as a quantitative, quantitative diagnostic of, uh, of this sort of unitary process where energy moves from one system into, a, into another. Uh, and in particular, there's this interesting time, uh, the page time, where we have this transition. Uh, so we'll justify why this, um, why this is saturated in a moment. Uh, just to sort of emphasize the fact that this is something to do with, um, with ordinary quantum systems, uh, get the first exercise is to, is to uh, basically compute the page curve um, for uh, the system uh, that I mentioned uh, at the beginning. So here we have some uh, box of photons for example. So that means that it has some thermodynamic, thermodynamic, so at a temperature T, it has energy proportional to T to the D plus one in uh, D spatial dimensions. Um, and we allow the photons to, to slowly escape. And we're going to assume that there's some weak interactions. So this is going to be uh, going to stay in equilibrium. If there were no interactions at all, then, uh, then the, uh, the photons wouldn't um, change their wavelength, for example, so we need some weak interactions. Uh, and uh, the exercise is to, um, so first of all, um, ask um, uh, yeah, what portion of the energy has uh, escaped at this page time. And then the second important thing is to um, compare uh, S thermal of A at the start with S thermal of B at the end. Okay. And in particular, uh, we know that, um, that uh, we have a second law of thermodynamics. So what you should get here is that uh, the thermal entropy of B at the end should be bigger than the thermal entropy of A at the beginning. Um, okay. So let's explain why uh, this bound is saturated. Uh, there's a, um, so we're going to make a crude model of the dynamics. And um, that means that uh, specifically, we're going to take uh, the state to be chosen essentially at random, given 
uh, given the fact that the um, the entire state is pure, so we have this, this uh, initial and final purity, and given the thermal entropies, we want to say that the state is otherwise essentially generic. So a, a crude way to do this is to model our full Hilbert space. Uh, so you write, um, uh, uh, model the Hilbert space of A as something finite dimensional, where uh, the dimension is E to the S thermal of A, and similarly for um, for B. So we have some finite dimension of Hilbert spaces. And then we um, model the, the state as, uh, as random, so par random, if you like. Um, so if we do this, then it turns out that, uh, that um, it's the, uh, the entropy is almost always exponentially close to, the, to this bound. So the gap between the red curve that provides the bound and the black curve that gives the the um, the entropy of a random state, this uh, this gap between these two, this is going to be exponentially small. So I can write that more quantitatively. So in this case, um, s or the difference between s or the way around. So. The minimum of S thermal of A and S thermal of B, that's the page curve, minus the actual von Neumann entropy uh, is going to be almost always, um, it's going to go like e to the minus the difference between these entropies, it turns out. There's some coefficient here. Okay. So this is a result due to page. Okay, so this is a very crude model, but um, but we expect that this should be reasonable as long as the time scales over which we have this evaporation. So the time scale over which the uh, the energy is moving from this system A into its environment uh, is going to be uh, long compared to the time scale of equi uh, equilibration here. So uh, and actually, the relevant um, comparison is we want the um, the, the typical time it takes for the evaporation, so for a certain amount of energy to escape, uh, should be much bigger than uh, uh, what's called the scrambling time. So this is the time it takes for uh, some small perturbation of the system to spread over the whole system. And a guess for what, what the scrambling time would be is roughly B times the log of the entropy, so the thermal entropy of A in this case. Uh, the reason for this log is that uh, if we create a small perturbation in the system, then it'll typically spread exponentially. So if we have a small perturbation, it interacts with some of its neighbors, uh, and now it maybe affects our, our original perturbation was on one degree of freedom. Perhaps now it, 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 uh, it's affecting three degrees of freedom. And then they interact with their neighbors, and it affects nine degrees of freedom, and so forth. So you get this exponential growth of perturbations. Uh, where the where the time scale of the exponential growth is um, some interaction time scale, typically of order the this thermal time scale beta, and S thermal of A is a measure of the system size. So this tells us when a small perturbation uh, grows to cover uh, all of A. So if we make some small perturbation that grows to cover A in a, the typical time that's before uh, the um, this system has evaporated very much, then, uh, then we expect this unit tree to be behave reasonably close to something that's completely random, this, the time evolution. Okay. Okay, so before moving on to black holes, uh, we're going to make, um, uh, talk about one more, um, one more setup that captures the same physics, but will be useful because it has a few uh, less um, sort of some technical simplifications. Are there any questions before I? Perhaps I'm going too slowly. But... Uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, uh, so so I, I want to ask about the uh, cost current entropy you introduced. 
uh, I want to know if, um, like, does this notion of cost grid entropy uh, require ETH or other assumptions from the system, or it can be applied to any quantum systems? Um, no, so it, this this applies to would apply to um, to any quantum system. Um, the um, okay, so this definition is very general. I've been um, I've been sort of vague, uh, but what's different in a system something that doesn't obey ETH? If you have some integrable system, then um, typically there'll be many many conserved quantities. So it's natural then to include those sorts of conserved quantities in macroscopic observables, and then it, that that they, those conserved quantities allow you to keep track of the dynamics much better. And so typically the thermal entropy won't uh, increase in rapidly. But, um, but it will really have in mind systems that, that have this sort of property that they're, um, the, the thing that's going to go uh, badly for systems that are integrable that don't obey ETH is that this, um, this sort of scrambling time scale is going to be, um, is going to be very long. So it means that um, the, the, your struggle to, it means you have to couple it very, very weakly to the reservoir. Um, and if you don't couple it weakly to the reservoir, then you won't get this saturation. But you always, always have this bound. And you'll, you'll always have uh, the bound that the red curve is above the black curve. Uh, and that's independent of what, you could even make a very bad choice of coarse grained entropy and you'll still have the bound. A good choice of coarse grained entropy will be one where it comes very close. I, I see. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. About the uh, thermal uh, definition of thermal entropy. So, uh, the, your definition is maximizing uh, the von Neumann entropy uh, given some microscopic observables. But if uh, there are multiple macroscopic observables, and if the uh, uh, corresponding uh, state rho tilde is different uh, from uh, observable to observable, then uh, which is uh, rho tilde do you choose? Um, um, so there's always, so you know to begin with that there's always going to be some density matrix that obeys all these constraints because your original density matrix is one option. Mm -hmm. um, if you have many, many, many um, macroscopic observables, if you if you decide that you're very powerful, then it may be that there are no other density matrices. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but actually there was another exercise I had in my notes. Um, but I should have said at the beginning I um, I have some notes that are under construction and will um, hopefully. I'll be able to share them with you uh, before or soon after the, the lectures are finished uh, that has some more details on the exercises. Um, but there is an exercise here is to, uh, is to show that, that row thermal is actually unique, which might have something to do with your question. Um, so you can't possibly have um, two separate um, uh, density matrices that obtain this maximum. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure if I... Thank you. Uh, could you say a few words about uh, why the gap is so small? Um, yeah, so well, um, that's oh, in, in, uh, from uh, explaining this result. Is that what you? Yes, the page result. Yes. Um, Let's see if there's a good justification. Um, I don't have an immediately good intuition to um, to share. Um, uh, Great things. Well, okay, so there's one, one reason why you might, um, uh, yeah, okay. I don't, I don't have a, a sharp intuition, perhaps I'll, um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll reflect on it and try to put something in the notes. Thanks. Okay. So let's move up on uh, onto this um, other setup. So what we're going to consider is a, a, a doubled system. So we're going to have um, two copies of A, A right, Oops, A right, and that's going to be coupled to this uh, reservoir system, E right. And we're going to have another copy, A left, that's going to be, uh, uh, and B left. So we're going to have our full Hilbert space is going to be a tensor product of these four factors, A left, B left, A right, B right. And uh, we're going to, um, uh, we've got some Hamiltonian, um, which is coupling these two systems. So when we had our two, two copy system, it was HA plus HB plus H interaction. So this is some weak interaction that couples the two systems. And um, what we do is we construct uh, the thermofield double slit. Okay, so um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, I'm sure this is, yeah. If you have any system with a Hamiltonian H, then the thermofield double is a state on the doubled system, which looks like this, e to the minus a half ke times e on the left, tensor e on the right, where these, uh, uh, these e's are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Uh, with energy z. So we're summing over all eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Um, so h e is equal to e. Uh, e. e. Okay. Um, then this state is, if you reduce on either half, so the density matrix on the right is going to be this uh, canonical density matrix that we uh, introduced earlier, that we're familiar with. Um, and uh, and there's now sort of two Hamiltonians acting on this system, H left and H right. So by definition, it's going to be invariant under H left uh, minus H right. It's, uh, it's going to cancel between these two terms, um, but it's still going to evolve in time under H left plus H right, or either H left or H right independently, that's equivalent. Um, now, um, so this, it has this nice symmetry, first of all, so that will give us some technical simplifications. Uh, another simplification here is that uh, over here, we had to choose uh, some, we had to make some choice of initial pure state and there's some sort of complete arbitrariness. You don't really know what to, to choose. There's no obvious choice. As whereas here, there's a canonical choice determined by the dynamics. So this thermal field double we're going to choose as our initial state. And uh, what we're going to ask about is the entropy A left uh, a right, um, which is equal to the entropy of B left, B right. Okay. Um, good. And um, we're going to ask how that, that evolves in time. And um, let's see. Uh, Okay, so um, initially, um, because this interaction Hamiltonian is weak, uh, this initial state roughly, uh, the energy eigenstates are, are, are going to be well approximated by products of, uh, of eigenstates between A and B. So that means that the thermal state on, uh, it means that this thermal field double state on A left, uh, if we take this thermal, thermal field double state on the four copy system, and reduce just to this piece of the system, then this is going to be approximately a thermofield double just on A. So A left, A right is approximately going to be um, this thermofield double for the Hamiltonian HA. And um, so in particular, it's going to have low entropy. Um, 
but we also um, certainly know what, uh, uh, there's a nice uh, obvious candidate for a coarse grain variable, uh, coarse grain entropy here, which is just to suppose that we have access to only observables in A left or observables in A right. We don't have access to any observables that couple the two. Uh, so that means that our thermal density matrix is just going to be a product of density of the, the density matrix in A left and the density matrix in A right. So we have this bound that the entropy of A left, A right um, is got to be less than the minimum uh, than well, entropy of A left plus A right. Um, this is actually a, the statement of, uh, of strong subrelativity. Um, but we also have the bound that S A left, A right is less than or equal to, um, actually this bound doesn't matter. Bound is not so important. Um, so now let's consider what happens as time uh, as time evolves. So this entropy a left a right is first of all it's bounded by so this is twice the thermal entropy at this temperature at this inverse temperature beta uh, of a. So this we've got this bound up here, which is twice uh, this s thermal of a. Um, but it starts initially uh, a small value because this a left a right is approximately a pure state. But as the as time evolves, we're going to have some uh, degrees of freedom move between these two pairs. So there's going to be some energy flowing in from a into b and from b into a. Uh, and as we do that, if you have maybe some uh, some degree of freedom a in a left that was originally entangled with the degree of freedom in a right this degree of freedom in A right can move out into the bath. And suddenly that gives us a contribution to the entanglement entropy of A left, A right. So uh, this steadily, we expect this to steadily increase. Um, but it can't steadily increase forever because at some point it's got to hit this bound. So at some point it's got to transition and actually plateau. Uh, so this is this is the the page curve for this situation. It's not really a page curve, but it's but it's capturing the same physics uh, essentially. Another way to think about this is that we can plot the mutual information between a left and a right. So that is s a left plus s a right minus s of a left a right, and that measures the correlations between a left and a right. And we instead get a curve that looks something like this. It starts off decreasing, but it, can, it can't decrease forever because this is bounded to be positive by, uh, by the subadditivity of entropy. So yeah, this measures the correlations between A left and A right, which are initially uh, very strong, but uh, are going to die out. OK, uh, I, and we'll, um, we'll talk about this example in the context of black holes, where it'll be um, useful. Any questions about that example before we? Move on to black holes. Oh, sorry, Henry. Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Please. Uh, maybe I missed it. Why S A L plus S A R equals to two S thermal? Oh, um, yes. So the this. Um, this, um, what do you want to say? So first of all, we know that um, that if we look at the sorry, the density matrix A left, B left, let's say, for example, this is actually exactly equal to um, to this thermal density matrix e to the minus beta, uh, where this is H A plus H B plus this H interaction divided by a partition function. So um, we know this is exactly a thermal state. Uh, so we actually know that rho A left is going to be approximately E to the minus beta H A over some partition function. This is Z A B, so Z A of beta. So this is if the interactions are small. If the interactions here are small, then we, and we, then we just have a product of thermal density matrices on A and on B. So, uh, in fact, the 
the von Neumann entropy itself is just a thermodynamic entropy of A. Um, so this, yeah, so this tells us that S of A left, the von Neumann entropy is approximately where the approximation of the small interaction equal to the, um, let's say the canonical entropy of, um, sorry, there's several Hamiltonians flying around. So the notation is a bit, um, uh, is a bit um, ambiguous. But does that answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, so um, section two. Okay, so um, um, so here's a fact from classical general relativity. So rapidly, a black hole after it forms, it um, it rapidly settles down to uh, to a, a stationary state, and the stationary states are uh, characterized by um, only by conserved charges. Um, so, in particular, the the mass. So we'll talk for simplicity mostly about black holes that aren't spinning, that don't have any, any um, charge, for example. So it would also be angular momentum and charge under gauge fields, but we'll focus on, on just the, the mass. Um, and we can write down, uh, write any static spherically symmetric metric in uh, these ingoing coordinates. So there'll be some transverse coordinates. So this describes the metric of the of the sphere and the um, uh, in the uh, uh, the the orbits of the spherical symmetry. So this is a general spherical symmetric metric. Um, and just to um, remind you of what this. So we we think of this v is uh, asymptotically gives a gives some kind of clock. So some clock of a distant observer, and it's constant on uh, ingoing um, null geodetics. So we have uh, the picture here is that we have some asymptotic observer that sits far from the black hole, and then you have the black hole is over here, and they define a coordinate by um, by there's some time here, and then you have an ingoing null geodetic with sort of time views. And this is convenient, uh, a convenient uh, choice of um, coordinate because in particular, the black hole will have some event horizon where light can't escape. So this is the, this is the interior of the black hole. The V is a good coordinate. Um, so this is going to be a good approximation when V is sufficiently long after the black hole is initially closed. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so this is maybe R over here. And um, if we just look at outgoing geodesics, outgoing um, null geodesics, then um, from this metric, we can straightforwardly write down what they look like. So if they're going to satisfy dr by dv is equal to a half f of r. So this is, unfortunately, I haven't planned this very well, so we can't get both equations in the same picture. Um, but in particular, um, uh, the event horizon is going to correspond to f of rh equal to zero, because then the outgoing null geodesics uh, are at constant or decreasing r, so they don't get out to, to infinity. Um, and something that'll be important for us is the, um, is the is the surface gravity of the black hole. Sure. 
will determine the physics. So it's kappa, which is half a derivative of the of this function f of the uh, okay, so in particular, near the uh, event horizon, we can approximate the metric like this. Everything I'm saying so far is sort of totally independent of what the asymptotics are and so forth. Um, so now, if we look at the outgoing null geodesics, they look um, they look something like R is R horizon plus A e to the kappa B. So in particular, you have this exponential divergence. Outgoing light, if you like. Okay, and um, the reason I've belabored this point, which is probably familiar to all of you, is just to emphasize that this, uh, this seemingly innocuous piece of uh, uh, you know, observation is really underlies a lot of the interesting physics of black holes. Um, yeah, so we can also use um, null coordinates. Um, U and V, so we've got this f of R is the same function of R and um, U is defined by usual things. So this is just to introduce some notation that we'll use later um, where um, dr star by dr. So r star is sometimes called the tortoise coordinate. So it's defined by this differential equation. And then you define the outgoing, um, the outgoing um, null coordinate u by this combination, and you end up with um, with this metric where r is defined implicitly by this. Okay, and um, in particular, we define u here to. I'll redraw this picture on the previous diagram. So we have uh, this is what our black hole looks like. Um, this is going to be some curve v is equal to t. So this is some some time t at the at the boundary. So I'm drawing it for some space-like boundary. This might be this might be a very distant observer in asymptotically flat space, or it could be a boundary of uh, antiparticular space. And this is u. Just here. So this is the, the, the coordinates. Um, okay. Um, so, in particular, in these null coordinates, we can uh, we can use this approximation for the geodesic and this um, this approximation for the uh, solution of the outgoing geodesics, and we find that in the near horizon, um, we have d s squared is um, uh, is approximately minus e to the kappa. Minus u, d u d v. Okay, so this is just um, just a change of, of coordinates. Uh, so this is when r is going to go to the uh, uh, going to r horizon. And just to remind you that this really applies to black holes formed from collapse. Um, this, um, what do I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when r, the radius r goes to the horizon, really this means that u is large compared to this. Um, uh, compared to the surface gravity. Okay, but this is just two-dimensional Minkowski space in disguise. So in particular, we can define some coordinates, capital U, some Triscoll-like coordinates, the minus capital U, and V is one over capital E to the capital uh, V. And with those definitions, we get uh, the ordinary flat metric in like coordinates. Um, so the picture here is that um, we have our our, uh, here's a, a Penrose diagram for a piece of flat space. And we're zooming in on a piece of flat space that's up here. And this piece of, uh, uh, and this is um, well approximated by the, or the event horizon of our black hole is, is, um, is closely related to, the, or is, looks approximately like a flat space time. Um, uh, the important thing to notice here again is we've got this exponential relationship between these coordinates little u and little v. So remember that so u and v are um, are going to be so these black coordinate coordinates uh, near the horizon, and little u and little v are um, defined by uh, by some asymptotic observer. 
So the important thing here is that the uh, that there's this exponential relationship between these two things. Uh, so the in particular the observer at uh, some very very large time. Um, sorry, the yeah, observer at some very large time uh, looks into his past light cone and all his null geodesics are piling up near capital U equals zero. So all his past null geodesics for an infinite amount of time are piling up near the event horizon. Okay. And this is the basic fact that's responsible for, for Hawking radiation. So to get a little intuition, we're going to look at time translation. So that acts as u goes to u plus t and v goes to v plus t, of course. Um, but if we tra uh, translate that through these exponentials, it means that capital U is going to e to the minus kappa t times capital U, and capital V uh, goes to e to the plus kappa t times V. And what is this in terms of flat space time? This is a boost. Um, so that means that the, the Hamiltonians, so this is the, the asymptotic time translation. In, uh, when we translate that into the near horizon, it looks like this kappa, the surface gravity, times uh, times a boost. So this is a boost in this near horizon region. Okay, and um, uh, now the um, so now let's ask what what the state looks like in the near horizon. So this is just a sort of heuristic. We'll um, we'll go back to this more carefully in a moment. Uh, there's an important fact that if you have any relativistically invariant theory, the density matrix on a half space. Uh, is proportional to e to the minus two pi times k, where k is the boost generator. So the underlying reason for that is that if we define, we usually define the vacuum by um, by a path integral on a on a Euclidean uh, half space. On a, sorry, on the on a, yeah on the Euclidean half space. But if we want to uh, look at the state on on just um, half of Minkowski space, then we can define the density matrix by this rotation. So, um, so a density matrix is, uh, yeah. So the reason for this is that K is a, uh, generates rotations. Um, excuse me. In Euclidean signature. So this is the, the sort of basic motivating reason. So we can think of this row half space as a, as a rotation by through an angle of two pi. Uh, so this, um, with our previous identification between the Hamiltonian and the boost uh, on the previous slide, um, looks something like e to the minus 2 pi over kappa times the Hamiltonian. So this motivates the idea that the, near, uh, the vacuum in the near horizon region looks a little bit like a thermal state as far as the asymptotic observer is concerned. With this is the Hawking temperature. Okay, this is um, this was extremely hand wavy, um, but uh, what we're going to go for now is to do some more careful calculations that really show that uh, that there's a flux of radiation at infinity with uh, with this sort of temperature. Um, and to do that, we're going to be a little bit more specific and introduce a uh, a model for matter. So in particular, we're going to talk about conformal matter in two dimensions. Um, so we're not going to need uh, too many details of, of conformal field theory if you're not familiar with it. Um, we'll just introduce what we need uh, along the way. Uh, but one of the particularly useful things is that uh, in uh, about conformal matter is that the dynamics of energy and momentum is completely determined by symmetries. So there's a um, there's a sort of easy way to see that is that you have a stress energy tensor which has 
which is a two by two matrix in two dimensions, but it's symmetric. So it has three independent components. So TAB has three independent components. Um, there are uh, conservation laws, del A, T, A, B equals zero. And that gives us two equations. Uh, but then um, there's also an equation for the trace of T for conformal matter. So that means we have um, three equations for three independent components. Um, so the three equations, three independent components, and we can solve these. Um, so um, you might be uh, think that the so conformally invariant matter means that there's no scale, so it should be invariant under scaling, and the trace of T generates uh, rescaling. So you might think the trace of T should vanish, but there's uh, but this is modified in curved space time, so there's an anomaly. Um, Um, and you can write this as the trace of the energy momentum tensor is C over 24 pi times the curvature of, of space time. Uh, I should warn you that I'm going to use um, conventions where um, the stress tensor is defined as if this is the usual definition in. Um, so this would be the CFT action. So this would be the classical way to define the energy momentum tensor. This is the usual um, convention for defining a stress tensor in, in gravity. And it has the nice, um, uh, this is the most natural uh, definition for most purposes. So in particular, T00 is the energy density, for example. Um, but, um, but in lots of CFT references, um, so the, the yellow book and, and Polchinski string theory book, for example, this is, um, there's actually a factor of minus one over two pi. So this can, this, this trip me up. So, so this is the usual CFT. So we're going to use this definition, not this definition, just to, to warn you. So you might have seen this equation of a, a, a minus C over 12, for example. And that's sort of this um, different convention. It's just a warning. Okay, so, so we know what the trace is and we know what the, um, uh, and we have the conservation equations. So let's write down a, a completely general metric in two dimensions. So this argument for Hawking radiation from conformal matter is going to be extremely general and extremely simple. Uh, so we have a general metric. So omega is some conformal factor. So we can always write a metric in light cone coordinates like this. Um, and the equation for the trace that we wrote on the last uh, page just becomes this derivative u, derivative v, omega. So this is the, tr the equation for trace t. Um, and then we get, um, uh, and then if we feed that into the conservation equations, del a t a b equals zero, uh, is an exercise to actually, to check all these things, uh, you get equations like this, c over 12 pi times del u squared omega minus del u omega squared plus some function which I'll call f little u of u. So this here can be a function of u and v depending on on what this your uh, your metric looks like but this here is only a function of u. So this tuu um, tells you about uh, I want to get the 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 correct direction here. So this TUU is telling you about um, outgoing energy. And uh, the reason it's only a function of U is because your energy density uh, can only depend on, on this direction. So if you follow the, uh, follow the matter outwards, then you're just, uh, then the outgoing flux is, uh, is going to be constant along outgoing light rays. Um, so this is, I just derived this for something uh, for, uh, sort of for classical stress tensor, but of course this holds also in the quantum theory for uh, this is going to be the one point function of the stress tensor in any state if there are no sources. So this is, um, okay. So this is quite nice. Uh, quite, and there's a similar relation for TVV. 
where there's some other function f of v of v and something similar here. So this is just very simply using the trace of t and applying conservation equations. Um, so um, let's look near infinity now. So there are two possibilities. So either um, asymptotically flat is omega um, is going to go to go to zero. So that's ds squared is going to become minus du dv. It's a flat metric, uh, or asymptotically ads, where ds squared is roughly minus uh, two or twice the ads length over u minus v squared du. Um, um, and you can work out what omega is for it's the logarithm of this. Uh, so in either of those cases, uh, they actually both give the same result here. Uh, you find that TUU asymptotically becomes minus C over 48 pi times kappa squared times FU of U, and TVV is minus C over 48 pi times kappa squared plus FV of V. Now, um, let's, so this is what, what the energy looks like at infinity. So in other words, we've, we've worked out, if, we def, if, we, if you tell me what the energy density looks like at infinity, uh, then I can tell you what the energy density looks like. Uh, then that determines these two functions, and I can tell you what the energy density looks like everywhere else. Um, but in particular, let's focus on this TUU. I'll write it down again. Plus FU of U. And that is um, near infinity. Um, but u is a, is a bad coordinate on the horizon. On uh, the horizon. So the horizon corresponds to little u goes to infinity. A better coordinate would be this Kruskal coordinate, capital U. So u goes to zero. Um, so uh, just the, the usual change of coordinates, we know that um, TUU in this U coordinate is going to be D capital U by D little U squared times T capital U capital U. And that is E to the minus two capital U T big U big U. Um, so um, that means that if TUU in the Kruskal coordinate is going to be finite at u equals zero, it means that this whole thing must decay exponentially. Um, so, um, So, so, sorry, near infinity, we have these equations. Sorry, I read the wrong, read the wrong equation number. So near infinity, so this is uh, at um, high goes to infinity, a large radius, you have this. So this means that FUU is the outgoing energy flux and uh, TVV is the ingoing, well, this FV of V is the ingoing energy flux. This other equation was near the horizon. It's in the near horizon region. Um, so we said that this has to decay exponentially in the near horizon, uh, but we've also got this relation with this function. So this fu is the, uh, this is the flux at infinity. So what that tells us is that this fu of u has to equal c over 48 pi kappa squared plus something that exponentially decay. So this exponentially decaying stuff is a, a two-dimensional version of, uh, of the quasi-normal modes. That's saying you have some, when the black hole is formed, there's some transient effect that, that dies away as all the energy falls into the black hole. Um, but then you're left over with this. 
So what this tells us is that we just said that the state had to be non-singular at the horizon. This is all we used at capital U equals zero. And that then tells us that, um, that there's a positive energy flux at infinity. Um, this is Hawking radiation. So this followed just from um, just from the conservation equations. It's a little more evolved if you do this in higher dimensions and uh, and track things out. But I thought this is a uh, in this in this particular simple setup, it's uh, it's extremely simple to show that that you have this positive energy flux. Um, and in particular, if this um, this T U U at infinity is two pi times C over twenty four times the square of the Hawking temperature. And this matches the, the thermodynamics of conformal field theories. Okay. Henry, do you want to take a look at the questions in the chat? There are, I see the two questions appeared in the last couple of minutes. Good, yes. One is, is conf uh -huh. one is about conformal flatness uh, 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 and uh, the topology of the manifold. So did you assume some special topology when you mentioned conformal flatness? Um, and then there's another question about F sub U and constraints. Um, yeah, so the, the first, first one, the first, uh, um, same, so this is just applies for any um, Lorentzian manifold. So I'm just, at the moment, we're just looking at, at some fixed Lorentzian space-time background where this is this is certainly true. Um, if you're yeah in Euclidean signature, then this you wouldn't be able to um, necessarily write the metric like this globally with some with some specific. You'd need several coordinate patches. Um, but um, but yeah, this is certainly true for Lorentzian manifolds. So, so we haven't assumed anything. And then the other question. Yeah, so yeah, and then the other question is this. Um, so the that was um, so it follows from this. So roughly speaking, um, this one of these constraint equations, for example, let's pick um, pick B is equal to U. Then um, this equation is going to have a term that looks a little bit like del U T U U, and the term that looks like del V. T V U, um, let's see if can see it. Uh, and so this term is going to be something like tell you T U V. So this is something that follows from the trace, and this term is going to be. So this is you because we have this um, this off diagonal light cone metric right? when you lower into C V swap U and these, and this is something like del V of T U. Okay, so this is it's a little bit more complicated because there's some um, because you're not in flat space time. There's some sort of Christoffel symbols and so forth uh, that go in here. But roughly, you can see the structure. You get one term that looks like the v derivative of tuu, and then you get some inhomogeneous term, which is determined by the by omega, yeah, by determined by the geometry. And hopefully, from that, um, so in other words, it's you get an equation that looks like the um, the actual equation you get is something like the v derivative of t u u is equal to something. Uh, and of course, integrating this equation, you, you, can, you can actually integrate this equation. It turns out that this, this piece on the right-hand side is a total derivative, and your, this is an arbitrary constant of integration or um, function of integration. So this is, um, I'll encourage you to do the exercise um, to, to just sort of Go through all the details, and uh, it might going through it in real time. It might seem like it's sort of complicated, but it's really a incredibly simple exercise that that, um, that shows um, that shows the result that is a, a lot more complicated to show in um, higher dimensions. Okay, other questions? Going a little slow on here. Um, 
so the last thing to show is that um, you can do something similar um, and and we look at what TBV looks like. Uh, so the as a reminder, TBV is FB of B minus uh, this half squared term, which is T over 48 pi. Um, and this is the incoming uh, energy flux. So that means that either we have two possibilities. So possibility one is that FBB is equal to zero. So this is what we would usually have in a, in a black hole. So uh, there's nothing falling in. And that implies that TBB is equal to minus C kappa squared over 48 pi at the horizon. So this is, uh, this is in the near horizon. So there's this negative ingoing energy flux. And uh, when we introduce dynamics, which we'll do in a moment, this back reacts and it causes the uh, evaporation. Alternatively, we could choose FBB. This is another possibility, which will be, uh, which will be useful in our examples. You choose the incoming state to, to have just the right amount of energy and uh, and then you keep the black hole at equilibrium, or at least in a steady state. Okay. So um, now we've uh, we've found out that we can put a black hole in contact with a system of. So th this this here tells us we can keep a black hole um, in contact with a system with. Uh, uh, with some system at a temperature of the Hawking temperature, and it can stay in equilibrium. So this is really the definition of the temperature of the black hole. If you can put one system in contact with a, with a bath at a particular temperature and it stays unchanged, then we say that system is at that temperature. This is the definition, this is the zero to law of thermodynamics. Like. So we have a temperature. Um, and we also know how to assign an energy uh, to a black hole. Uh, so it's natural now to use a first law uh, to define an, an entropy. So yes, BH for black hole, or for perhaps Beckenstein Hawking, is something like this. So this function of the Hawking temperature as a function of the energy of the black hole is something that will depend on the details of the model, but it's something we can compute very simply from the, uh, we just have to know the classical solutions. It's just given by this, um, the surface gravity. Uh, and the energy, again, we can calculate from the solutions. So the energy usually comes from, uh, from asymptotic symmetry. Um, and in Einstein gravity, famously, um, this is given by, um, it's given by the area of the event horizon in Planck units. Uh, okay, this is very famous. Um, and it's no uh, coincidence that this turns out to be a, a local functional of the event horizon. And in fact, we'll see that, I guess, tomorrow. Um, we'll give a, a very general derivation that this is, um, this is a, a local geometry of the horizon. So there's an interesting thing here that the, um, the black hole entropy is something to do with the local geometry of the horizon. The temperature is something that looks like it's to do with the local geometry of the horizon, again, because it was given by the surface gravity, but it's really about how the local geometry of the horizon relates to time at infinity. And then there's energy, which is measured at infinity. So there's, but we'll see why this all ties together tomorrow. Um, of course, this is historically the wrong way around. Um, really, Bekenstein started off proposing that, that, um, that black holes should have an entropy by thinking about the second law, and then Hawking tried to prove him wrong because that would mean they have, should have a temperature. And when Hawking tried to prove him wrong, he found actually that he was completely right. Black holes do have a temperature. And um, okay, so now it's very natural to um, conjecture that this S 
black hole is is a thermal entropy in the sense that we described above, uh, if we described in the, the first part. So, um, so in particular, the fact that a, the black holes always settle down to uh, to the stationary metric defined by their conserved quantities suggests that uh, a natural notion of coarse graining is just to specify those conserved quantities. And then this tells us that the dimension of the Hilbert space associated with the black hole should go something like e to the entropy of the black hole. Um, so in other words, we're led to the idea that black holes behave like an ordinary quantum system with this, uh, with this density of states. Um, now, so far, there's no problem. So we just computed the, um, up here, we computed what the dynamics of stress energy was, and we looked at uh, the energy of the state of infinity, and we showed there was this argument, assuming that the horizon is smooth, then you end up with this flux of uh, you end up with this flux of energy at infinity, and um, this is fine. But um, but actually, if you dig into this in more detail, uh, and we'll see this explicitly by computing entropy, we'll learn that not only does the state look like it's thermal with this temperature um, kappa over two pi, but it really is very well approximated by a thermal state. So it really has. Um, so the, the, in other words, the thermal entropy of the radiation is very close to the, uh, the actual von Neumann entropy. And this will run into problems with our page load. So, so there's trouble ahead. Okay, so any questions about this? Um, so this is the first, the first way we're going to see this, um, this entropy is by, uh, by this first law. Um, We'll see it another couple of ways. Does the one and the one informer depends on the state of CFP, the state of the conformal matter? Uh, you have this choice of the energy moment tensor proportion of the curvature oh. um, the to scalar. Um, it, so does that depend on, for example, what has to choose the vacuum state of the, um, the no, theory? This actually, this is true. Um, this is really a, an operator equation. This is true identity apart from contact terms. Uh, so, um, yeah. Oh, I see, okay. It's yeah, completely thanks. independent of the state. So we weren't assuming anything whatsoever about the state so far. The only, um, so we didn't assume anything about the state. The only, the only thing we assumed so far, so we use these conservation equations that hold in any state, it's completely independent of the state. And we just assumed that the state was non-singular at the event horizon which is saying that this T capital U, capital U, the stress tensor in crystal coordinates was finite. That's the only things we used. It's very minimal assumptions. Okay, thanks. Um, but perhaps this is a good time to emphasize this, this is an important point, is that this exponentially decaying piece with these quasi-normal nodes, uh, that actually is a sign that, uh, that taking the, the outgoing state to look like the vacuum is going to be an excellent approximation uh, after um, on timescales that are only um, a few times one of a kind. Well, so actually I do quite understand that the operator equation. So, I mean, on the right hand side, you have basically the curvature scalar times, I suppose the identity operator if you want to interpret that as an operator equation. Yes. Uh, so, so, so how could the trace of the energy moment tensor be proportional to the identity operator of the field theory? Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I suppose at some point you have to take a that or, you know, take some sort of say expectation value so that you can get numbers. Um, so this is, this is literally, so it means that if you have, if you insert TAB of X in any, um, so this are these, these can be any operators, and this can be in any state psi. You look at this expectation value, and you contract upstairs with the metric. Then that is really equal to replacing this with the c over twenty four pi times. In, okay, right, pi. right. So, right. so, 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 I guess what I'm a bit confused about is that I mean, it, I mean, it seems your derivation would apply for any state for the conformal matter. That would be surprising because you get a unique value for, for example, see the flux. 
Um, I, I mean, I would imagine if you change the state, you may get it's just a slight different answer. So this isn't a um, uh, unique, it doesn't give us a unique value for the flux. So roughly speaking, the stress tensor, you have these um, TUU, TBV, and then you have the off-diagonal components, TUV, and this light cone coordinates. And the trace, at least in flat space, the trace is telling you about the off-diagonal components. The, so the top left is telling you about the outgoing flux. The bottom right is telling you about the ingoing flux. And then the off-diagonal components are telling you something else. They're telling you about the pressure. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, so it doesn't, so it's enough to, it doesn't over constrain us. You, you'll notice we've got just the right number of equations. Uh, so this is, of course, related to the fact that uh, very closely, intimately related to the to, uh, Verisaurus symmetry and so forth. Um, right. It's not over, I mean, it's not over constraining, but once, so after you're combining the wild anomaly constraint, um, the conservation conditions, and also the non singular I mean, the non singular behavior at the horizon at top, you completely determine um, uh, the components of T. And yeah. So I don't. Yeah. So I don't quite see where the state dependence. I mean, I mean, how the state dependence is being removed. I mean, just like I would imagine, you can probably change the state a little bit. Yeah. So I mean, th this is really um, if you're familiar with. Um, Conformal field theory. This is just the the this is the the Lorentzian version of the statement that um, the, the the stress tensor is a holomorphic function, or rather, there's a holomorphic stress tensor around it. Um, in the, yeah, I I would in, I'd encourage you to go uh, go do the exercise and check this makes sense. And, um, and um, I would have liked to uh, derive the viral anomaly, but. Um, in fact, so, so, a document camera. I can. Uh, this is beautifully explained in uh, in section three point four of the Kinsky book. So I, I encourage you to go. And, uh, yeah, thanks for the encouragement. But still, I just want to get the statement straight. So, is so in the end the statement that, or the conclusion that, um, the flux is independent of the state? Uh, the trace of the stress tensor is is state independent. Yes. Right and. Having that, say, applied to the present situation, is the conclusion that in the end, the flux of the radiation is independent of the state of conformal matter. So the flux of the radiation isn't independent of the state. So this, for example, this capital T, T capital U, T U U, that tells you about the outgoing flux near the horizon. And there could be some outgoing flux. Um, we're only assuming that it's finite, and and it was very important that that this well, this is a factor of um, this is proportional to one over, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure. It's proportional to u squared. I guess. Okay, no, I can't remember which, which way that is. Um, yeah, this is proportional to u squared. So it's three times. Um, yeah, so we only use this finiteness. It's, um, so the important thing, uh, uh, maybe a, another way to explain this. Okay, yeah. so you didn't really say so yeah. the Hawking flux for us. But did you, I mean, uh, I mean Maybe that's the part I missed. I mean, you sort of determine the Hawking radiation, or the Hawking temperature, but not the flux. Um, so what we've really computed is the flux of energy. So we've used the fact that the, there's finite flux of energy at the horizon, so uh, uh -huh. the state non-singular, and then we've just solved the uh, conservation equations to evolve that flux, that finite flux in the near horizon, out to um, out to infinity and infinity looks like this. All right. Okay. The way, one way of understanding it perhaps is that uh, a conformal diagram for, for our um, black hole, maybe an asymptotically flat space, would look something like this. So here's, there's some, we form some black hole from collapse. It doesn't, uh, uh, there's some event horizon and um, and if we were to, this is, um, um, if we were to extend this to all of Minkowski space, it would be um, conformally flat to, to something, uh, some region that looked like this. So in particular, the, uh, we would have to extend scry plus to, um, to 
beyond u equals infinity. So this is the point u equals infinity, which is the event horizon. So what we're really looking at uh, to, in, in some sense, is, is, a, is a state on only half of scribe plus. And what it's telling us is that if we look close to this endpoint, then, uh, and we do an appropriate formal transformation, then the state on this half space looks dumb. So it's actually extremely intimately closely related to that heuristic argument I gave about, um, about the states on a half space in the generation of boost. 